Hey, Brother Roy here, Old School Bible Baptist Ministries. Got an interesting one for you today. Y'all know I was in prison for 30 years. And you know that uh, um, on that last prison sentence, uh, that's where God got a, got a hold of me, uh, brought, brought me back, came back into the ministry, ended up spending that last 10 years in prison um, as the pastor of the church, High Desert State Prison, uh, assigned to the chapel, uh, doing Christian services, <clears throat> excuse me, every day. And, uh, but right when I uh, uh, first got back there, and I was first going back to chapel uh, before uh, before I was working in the chapel or the pastor of the church there. When I was when I was just getting right and coming back in, um, I wrote something. All right, and uh, it was uh, it was something that was for uh, a ministry that was called Belief and Faith Ministry out of Pahrump, Nevada. And what it did, it just uh, uh, printed and sent in biblical materials to men in in prisons around the country. And so I wrote a pamphlet, if you will, for it. And uh, it got put on that site and it and began. I don't know how many of them ever got sent out, but here's the, here's the thing. It, it, it's called Doctrines That Divide. And it's what doctrines divide the Christian churches by Roy Bell, 2013. So, yeah, that's that is uh, that's when I wrote that was it in 2013. So, my question today is: uh, It's been over a decade since I wrote this. Does it still stand up? And do I still stick? With by everything I said. All right. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's pray and, and, and we'll read it. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for your Jesus. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for our salvation, Lord. Oh, God, you know we couldn't earn it ourselves because we are a mess. And so we just thank you for your grace and we thank you for your word. Um, and God, just uh, uh, now bless in these next few moments as we read about doctrines that divide. Amen. 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 Okay. So starts off and says, what doctrines divide the Christian churches? So many denominations, so many doctrines. The word doctrine simply means a teaching. How can so many sincere church folk read the same Bible <laughs> and come up with so many conflicting teachings? The apostle Peter writes in 2 Timothy 1.20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So when we have conflicting interpretations, somebody is wrong <laughs> and the Bible is right. Uh, the apostle writes in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. According to Paul, there are some right divisions in the Bible that we need to be aware of to study it. Miles Coverdale, who translated the first complete English Bible in 1535, is famous also for this quote. It shall greatly help ye to understand Scripture if they'll mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth after. The word for this is context. Uh, remember this, context always determines content. And a text without a context is a pretext. And pretext just means an excuse. Many errors in doctrine today stem from not having an understanding of context in relation to God's dealing with Israel and God's dealing with the church. Remember this, things that differ are not the same. So, Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jews or Hebrews, begin with Abraham. God makes an everlasting covenant with him, Genesis 17, 7 and 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, 
for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God also told Abraham in Genesis 12, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, 2, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Abraham, his son, Isaac, Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons who become the 12 tribes of Israel during their 400 years in Egypt. God raised up Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt and back to the promised land. Moses does this with a great multitudes of signs and wonders. This becomes a pattern of God's dealing with the nation of Israel. The apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.22 that for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. At Mount Sinai, God gives Israel the law or the Mosaic covenant. After Israel is back in the promised land, God gives them a king, David. God promises David in 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will establish his kingdom. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is the Davidic covenant. There are many spiritual elements to these three covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant that are fulfilled in Christ. But that does not negate the physical promises of a king and a kingdom in the promised land. So far, God established a called out people, the nation of Israel, and gave them a promised land and the law. He promised them an everlasting kingdom and a king. He tells them that all the world will be blessed through them. All the prophets speak of the coming king of Israel. He will be the anointed one or Messiah. He will be the Lord of hosts or God with us. They speak of his perfect kingdom on earth where all nations of the earth come to Jerusalem to worship God and learn of him through his nation of priests. This is what every Jew in the Old Testament, the Gospels and the book of Acts is looking for hoping and waiting for. Nobody knew anything about the Gentile church. This was a mystery revealed by the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul in Colossians 1, 24 through 27 explains this. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Where for I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but is now made manifest unto his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul gives us God's message for us in this age, the gospel of the grace of God in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now that is the gospel that saves us as Gentile believers in the age of grace. The gospel that John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus, and the apostles preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and in the early chapters of Acts is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the national message exclusively directed to Israel and the Jews about their land, their king, and their kingdom. When Jesus tried to tell his disciples about his death, burial, and resurrection, they did not get it. Look at Mark 9, 32. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. Even after his resurrection, Jesus is still talking to the Jews 
about their kingdom in the promised land. Acts 1-3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Acts 1-6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now remember, the Jews required a sign, and that is how God deals with them. Why did Christ perform all his miracles? To validate to Israel that he was their coming king and Messiah. So after his resurrection, Jesus tells the disciples to wait to be filled with the Holy Ghost, to be empowered to perform signs and wonders before Israel to validate that Jesus was their Messiah. There is no Gentile church or body of Christ anywhere in the early chapters of Acts taught. Now remember, just because a thing has not yet been revealed does not mean it did not exist. But who does Peter preach to in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3? Acts 2 and 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. This is accompanied by signs and wonders, but the message is not received by the nation of Israel as a whole. When Stephen makes his address before the Jewish high council, they stoned him to death. We hear Stephen saying that he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Acts 7, 55 and 56, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Jesus was ready to come back and restore again the kingdom to Israel if they would have received Stephen's message. Of course, that did not happen, and God knew they wouldn't. But from here on, we always see Jesus seated at the right hand of God. It is at this point that God calls the Apostle Paul as Apostle to the Gentiles and reveals to him the gospel of the grace of God and the mystery of the Gentile body of Christ. As the Gentiles begin to believe Paul's gospel and get saved, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem try to make the Gentile believers get circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. In Acts chapter 15, Paul and the 11 original apostles have a council to address the issues in Acts 15, 5 through 6. Acts 15, 5 through 6. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And what was their decision? Acts 15, 10 through 11. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe... But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Amen. Gospel is locked in, set in stone in Acts 15. And from then on and forward, all of the apostles preach the same message delivered by Paul. Because Peter says, what? He doesn't say they get saved like us. Peter says we get saved just like them even as they. Amen. And that is only through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how we are rightly dividing what is for who? We have one group of people, Israel, with a certain message and set of physical promises concerning the promised land and the kingdom. We have another group of people, mostly Gentiles, saved by grace through, through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ with no element of works, no element of law, Israel has works involved in their salvation because they require a sign. God has always dealt with them with visible, visible 
signs and wonders. They needed them with faith like we do. I'm sorry, they did not have the permanently indwelling spirit of Christ pro providing through faith. Oh, I'm sorry. They did not have the permanently indwelling spirit of Christ providing them with faith like we do. We have Christ in us. We are saved by grace through faith. Faith is evidence of things not seen. That is the opposite of signs and wonders. That is why Jesus says to us, John 20 and 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. Now, if you can get a grip on all that that I just read, amen, then the whole Bible will just open up to you and everything will click into place. There will no longer be any seeming contradictions, but if you try to take something Jesus said to the Jews under the law about their kingdom promises and apply that to Gentile believers in the age of grace, well, then you're going to run into serious doctrinal problems. Don't try to cram the square peg in the round hole. It don't go there. Hopefully, having uh, gotten the general context of context here, Let's look at a few of the doctrines that divide us into denominations and see how the Bible in context can clear up some of these misunderstandings. Let's look, number one, at the perpetuity of spiritual gifts. Many Christians believe and seek the sign gifts of the apostolic period, which include speaking in tongues and healing. In 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, Paul writes this, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. He ties the signs and wonders to the ministry of the apostles <laughs> and the apostolic period. Why? <laughs> Who required a sign? The Jews. Why? As validation of Jesus as their king and Messiah. The signs were given to Gentile believers for a short time to demonstrate to the Jewish believers the Gentiles were now included in the salvation. Look at Acts chapter 11. When Peter has just returned to Jerusalem from Caesarea, where a group of Gentiles in the house of Cornelius were saved, the Holy Ghost fell on them, and they spoke in tongues just like the Jews did in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 11, 15 through 18. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Verse 16, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Even when signs and wonders involved Gentiles during the transitional period in the book of Acts, it is still a sign for the Jews. That is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22, In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, the Jews, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore our tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. See the context? It is Jews either believing or not believing their promised Old Testament sign when the nation of Israel nationally fully and completely rejects Jesus Christ. God turns the message of salvation to the Gentiles in Acts 18, 4 through 6. Acts 18, 4 through 6. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit 
and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own hands. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go to the Gentiles. And finally, in Acts 28, 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. This is the fall of Israel. Romans 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. God puts Israel on the shelf for a couple thousand years. Since God is not dealing with them, guess what fades away? You got it. Signs and wonders, tongues, special healing gifts. God still heals, just not through people with a special gift. By the end of the book of Acts, Paul cannot even heal his own friends. 2 Timothy 4.20 Erastus bowed in Corinth, but Trophimus have I left in my leadum sick. Again, Paul writes about tongues in 1 Corinthians 13.8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. 1 Corinthians 13. And now abideth what? Now abideth faith, hope, and charities, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. What were tongues? Clearly defined. First time they're mentioned in Acts 2 and 26. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because Every man heard them speak in his own language. Listen, this <laughs> spiritual prayer language, yabba dabba hubba dubba do, is not found in scripture in context. First Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. Did Paul do all these things that he mentions in that verse where he says, though I have all faith to remove mountains, uh, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned? Uh, it, no, no. This is called hyperbole. It is like saying, if I could fly like Superman, if I had all the money in the world, get it? Also, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. He says, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. If you stopped reading right there, you might be able to sell it, but not with context. As you read, for no man understandeth him, Paul then goes on for the next 30 verses about the importance of only speaking in tongues with an interpreter or a translator. So everyone can understand what is being said because it was a sign for the Jews. What people are experiencing now in this modern tongues movement is an emotional delusion. The same kind of thing can happen at a concert or a ball game, mass hysteria, the power of suggestion, or possibly something demonic. We have to be careful. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There's a lot of stuff that comes from the inside of us that is fleshly and soulish in nature. They come from our own soul, not from the Holy Spirit. Feelings. How can we tell the difference? Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirits and the joints of marrows. Amen. He's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Only the word of God can make the separation. If your experience is not scriptural, it's not from the Holy Spirit, the next doctrine that we will look at is closely related to this one, and that is Holy Ghost Baptism. Many misguided brethren seek a secondary blessing after salvation, seeking to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. 
usually evidenced by speaking in tongues, like in the early chapters of the book of Acts. This one we have partially covered in the last section. It only takes two verses in context to put this doctrine to rest. Speaking of our salvation, experience, or our being joined to the body of Christ, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 and Ephesians 4, 4 through 5, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we are bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And in Ephesians 4 through 5, there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Listen, you were baptized in the Holy Ghost when you were baptized into the body of Christ when you were saved. And then water baptism is just a figure, symbol, or picture of that one saving baptism. Now look, you cannot get any clearer than that. When you're saved, you are spiritually immersed, baptized into the body of Christ, and there is only one baptism. Amen? Amen. So why is anybody looking for another one? That's right. Next one, the Sabbath. Many believers teach that as Gentile believers in the age of grace, that we are obligated to keep the Jewish Sabbath. We just reviewed the passages in Acts 15, where the apostles met in Jerusalem and mandated once and for all that Gentile believers would not be commanded to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. The Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. That's the law of Moses. The Sabbath was a commandment specifically given as a sign and covenant for the nation of Israel. Exodus 31, 16, and 17. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath through their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days God made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That is pretty clear, right? Also interesting to note that all of his letters, Paul makes mention of every commandment at one time or another, except the Sabbath. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy back at creation, but he never told anybody to observe it in any ceremonial fashion until the law was given to Israel. You won't find anybody observing the Sabbath anywhere from Adam to Moses. The Sabbath was only for Israel under the law, putting everybody in their proper context, clears up the issue again, rightly divided. Eternal security. Many believers are under the misunderstanding that it is possible to lose or walk away from their salvation. This was definitely true of the Jews under the law, but it is not possible for a born-again believer in Christ. It is simply not understanding what salvation is that would ever lead a person to think that it is reversible. The Apostle John said in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So if you had it, then lost it, it wasn't eternal, was it? <laughs> eternal does mean forever. Understanding salvation means understanding the three tenses of salvation, past, present, and future. These are called in the scriptures justification, sanctification, and glorification. As an aid to memory, we use the three Ps to define these. Justification, a past tense operation in which we were once and for all delivered from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, a present tense process by which we are being delivered from the power of sin. And glorification, a future tense event in which we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. Let's look at these one at a time. It will be gr help, greatly help us understand the salvation of human beings by first understanding what a human being is. Man, created in the image of God, is a triune being. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When God created man, he took the dust of the earth, his body, breathed into it the breath of life, spirit, and man became a living soul. 
Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In John 4, 24, Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It is the spirit part of man that is God conscious and capable of communion with him. The soul is the seat of our mind, will, and emotions, and is self-conscious. The body is the seat of the five senses and is world conscious. When Adam and Eve were in the garden of Eden and God told them that in the day they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that they would surely die. Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did Adam and Eve drop dead as soon as they ate of it? No, they died spiritually. Think of a person like a football. The outer skin is your body. The inner tube is the same shape and is the, your soul or ghost, if you will. And the air inside is your spirit. We were flat footballs before we were saved. We were a living soul in a living body, but dead spiritually until we received an infusion of spirit that is the spirit of Christ or the Holy Spirit. We were immersed into him we believers are collectively his body. He is the head of the body. Uh, the church, Ephesians 1, 22, 23 says, and hath put all things under his feet and given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So what can be said of him can be said of us. Let's look at what Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you see that little word? Hath. That's past tense. That's justification. Based on the finished work of the cross, God has forgiven us all sin, past, present, and future. Now, because sin has forever been done away with, or rather, the judicial penalty for sin has once and for all been paid. It is now possible for a holy God to join and indwell sinful man. We become one with Christ. We are in him and he is in us. First Corinthians six seventeen says, but he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Amen. That's what happened to your flat football, your dead spirit. It was born again. In Ephesians 4.30, we are told and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. This is explained in Colossians 2.11 and 12, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, whereas also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. A surgical procedure was performed on you at the moment of salvation. Your body of sins or flesh was cut away from your eternal soul. Our soul was then sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption. That body that is going down, it is connected by the Holy Spirit, who is already in heaven, so you are on the way up. This is the unspeakable wonder of the new birth. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is our once and for all deliverance from the penalty of sin. Justification, past tense, done. It is finished. You get the idea? You can't undo what he did. Someone will, will ask, does that mean I can sin all I want now? That question leads us to look at the present tense area of our salvation, which is sanctification. Sanctification is an ongoing process. Many believers who think they can lose it confuse scripture dealing with sanctification and justification. Sanctification is the process whereby God is conforming us into the image of his dear son. It is a lifelong journey, still by grace, still by God. Philippians 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We can help or hinder this work in us by yielding to the spirit or to the flesh. When we surrender to the lust of the flesh, we are lacking faith, not believing God. He has told us that we are crucified with Christ, that the body of sins might be destroyed, 
But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Read Romans chapter 6. When we go our own way after the flesh, our loving Father must correct us. That is sanctification. What happens when we begin to walk in the flesh? Hebrews 12, 5 and 8. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, 5, to deliver unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Jude 1, 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3, 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 1 John 5, 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. One way or another, God's will shall be done. Romans 18, 28, I mean 29 and 30, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That brings us to glorification. Glorification is the part of our salvation that is yet to be received or still in the future. When Christ returns, we will be changed. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 through 53. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold then, I show you a mystery. Amen. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. This future event will be our deliverance for all eternity from the very presence of sin and its effects on creation. It is our glorification. So in review, justification, past tense, penalty for sin. Sanctification, present tense, power of sin. Glorification, future tense, presence of sin. That is all included in our great salvation. And because the past tense nature of justification, the operation of God, you are 100% once saved, always saved. Praise His holy name. He is both the author and the finisher of our faith. Brings us to the next one, water baptism. Water baptism finds its origins in the ceremonial washings and cleansing of temple worship. John the Baptist calls all of Israel to be baptized into repentance in preparation for the restoration of the kingdom unto Israel. In the advance of their Messiah King, Jesus, disciples carried on the same practice, the same kingdom message. The Greek word baptizo means immerse. Every instance of water baptism in the New Testament and the Gospels and the books is Acts is by immersions, like at the Jordan River, Acts 8, 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. As the condition for water baptism, Philip tells the Ethiopian, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So that water baptism, as practiced by the apostles, was immersion 
of believers, people that had already been saved, there's nowhere in Scripture of anyone baptizing an infant or sprinkling anyone. And we continue to water baptize believers, saved people, because Paul's converts continue to be clear through the end of the book of Acts. And he never told anyone that water baptism was to cease. Now, we get to the end time events, the rapture. A lot of division there. This is a very detailed subject that takes a lot of study, so much so that a special blessing is provided. Revelation 1.3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. First issue to address is whether we're going to believe what God says. Some folks say uh, that uh, all this end time prophecy stuff is allegory or symbolic or not literal. Uh, since end time prophecy revolves around the return of Christ in the millennium or the 1000 year reign of Christ on earth in fulfillment of Abrahamic and Davidic covenants, those who do not take God's word literally are called amillennialists because they do not believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth and think all these prophecies will fulfilled in Christ's first advent. Those of us who believe our Bibles take every word of God literally, believe that God will fulfill all future prophecy in the same way that he fulfilled all prophecies concerning the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is literally. We are called premillennial because we look for Christ to return literally, physically, and visibly to establish his millennial kingdom and fulfill all of his covenant promises to the nation of Israel. Jesus is coming. No disagreement there if you're a Bible believer. The big disagreement here revolves around a seven-year period or time called the tribulation that takes place right before and concludes with the return of Christ. Some folks believe that the body of Christ, the church, will be raptured or taken up, remember, glorification, before the seven-year tribulation. Others believe that the church will go through the tribulation and be raptured at the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation. I'm going to get a little personal here. I've studied everything I could get my hands on for over 30 years uh, on this issue. And uh, you can make a good scriptural argument uh, either way until you learn to rightly divide. The case for a pre-tribulation rapture is much stronger than any other position, and uh, that comes from understanding the difference between Israel and the church. So once you take all of those verses, like in Matthew 24, uh, Luke 21, Mark 14, uh, about the second return of Christ to fulfill his kingdom, you separate those verses that are for Israel about the second advent from the verses in the Pauline epistles that are about the catching away or the rapture of the church, once you rightly divide the scriptures like that, it becomes very clear uh, that the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Conclusion. I think I will leave you with Paul's admonition to the Ephesian elders. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. He said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There's nothing new under the sun. Someone's going to pervert the gospel of the grace of God by adding some element of self or works or religious tradition to it, something belonging to Israel in another age. It is our job to rightly divide the word of truth. Remember the Bereans. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, 
who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You have to study it all out for yourself. Multitudes of good, godly people are sincerely wrong on a lot of doctrinal issues. It's natural to respect and follow Christian leaders, parents, etc., but they are humans too and subject to being misled. We have to come to the Word of God like a blank slate and let the Holy Spirit show us what it says, not what a denomination or a tradition teaches. The Word of God must be our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. We only touched on a few of the problem doctrines running rampant in the church today. There are more. Also, the cults who deny even the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith that all Orthodox Christians believe are growing like crazy today. We need to purify our doctrine, clean up our own house, that all men may see our unity, but never sacrifice truth for the sake of unity. Jude 1.3 Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith delivered unto the saints. God bless you, dear reader, as you study God's inerrant, inspired, infallible, and preserved word. And that was my pamphlet from 2013, High Desert State Prison. And there's a reason we call this channel Old School Bible Baptist, because guess what? We sticking by every word we said back then, and it all holds up by the book, because it's all Old School Bible Baptist stuff. Hey, just stick to the book. You won't go wrong, and you won't be like those who are blown about by every wind of changing doctrines when you know what you know what you know, what the book says. Just believe and believe the book. Amen. God bless you. I hope that was a blessing to you, and we'll see you in the next one.